It is. Uh, the JMV sucks. Golf outing a week from today. Foxcliff, north of Martinsville, off of State Road 37. On the Andy Moore Automotive Group Hotline, it is the segment that you have to listen to each and every week. Must hear with Rick Venturi right here. All right. I, I've been trying to toe the line, I guess, a little bit because there were good things. There have been good things that we have seen so far, yet this team still finds a way to be one and two right now. I, I mean, there were so many good things to talk about yesterday, but at the same time, Rick, there are some bad things and ultimately bad things that led to that loss. Yeah, there's no question about it. I mean, I, I think, you know, the good news about this team is that, you know, when you watch it, it's it's a very relevant team in 2018. It's going to be relevant. I think, you know, there were some people that, you know, were looking at 2-14. and 14. They were uh, they were totally underestimating. Uh, obviously, there's been people that, that uh, uh, underestimated and overestimated, but it is a relevant football team that is definitely in the class of uh, of 28. You know, you got that two, two at the top, two at the bottom, and 28 – and they're definitely in that 28. There's, there's no question about that. Uh, you know, but the shame of it all, it still is not playing good enough to win. It, it's playing good enough to compete and to be in there. And the shame of this one, the shame of this one, and I said it all week. I'm not, I'm not Monday after the fact. I said that Philadelphia was so vulnerable. Philadelphia, this was the week if you were ever going to play them and beat them this year. Uh, it's now. I mean, they've struggled. The people that think that this is a big upset to be close just don't understand the NFL and haven't really studied. Philadelphia has not played like the world champion since the beginning of the summer, and for obvious reasons. They don't have Jeffrey. They don't have a deep threat. Uh, They lost to Jai, which is tremendous because he's the number one guy they got. And so, you know, when we went in there, you know, we really had the opportunity to win the game and in some ways, you know, we came unglued again. I mean, as, as well as we play on defense um, at times, you know, we did come unglued. Um, I, I thought if you, just, if you just want to look at four things to me, the four things that big picture things that just hit me between the eyes after I watched the tape, you know, when you take the emotion out of it, sometimes it looks better on tape, sometimes it looks worse on tape. To me, it looked a little worse on tape, to be really honest with you. Um, there's no, there was really very little offense all day. I mean, you got, uh, you know, with your, uh, with your regular running backs, you got 34 yards rushing and we got 141 yards passing. That's not a good Friday night even. Now we did get two, uh, PIs, which would add to the pass offense, but in a sense, 35 yards rushing and, uh, you know, and 141 passing that, that's just, that's just not going to do it. Uh, I thought after looking at the tape, I just I just thought our run defense was horrendous. It's just absolutely horrendous, and you know, and at the very end of the game when they had to hammer it, they hammered it to win it. But it happened the whole game. I mean, it was that way the whole game. We, you know, I do think there's probably, um, you know, when the when the other team has the ball 40 minutes, there is a um, there is a worn down effect. But uh, but the running game was really there for them all day, and I mean, and they did it with. Smallwood and Adams. I mean, you know, I mean, you're you're talking about a hundred and fifty some yards, you know, with basically their JV backs. I mean, that's really disheartening, um, you know. And then the penalties were just, you know, the penalties were killers. Um, you know, some of them you may not like them. Uh, I particularly don't like a couple of them, but uh, you know, the thing is, is I just don't like the game officiated that way. But I think the officials, though they, you know, I thought they called an overly tight game. Uh, I like to let them play a little bit more. Uh, but the calls were there. So, I mean, you can't, you know, they, they were there, so you really can't argue it. You know, and then at the end of the day, the fourth quarter, they finished it and we didn't. I mean, on both sides, they, they finished it and we didn't. And that's, uh, you know, that, that's, that's what it comes down to. You play really competitive with them. And like I said, the shame of it is that, you know, you could, I mean, you could be 3-0 and right now very, very easily. Uh, you know, a drop ball, in the, you know, inside the red zone, a fumble inside the red zone. Um, as tough as those things, as tough as that picture I just painted, we still are down there with two shots and the three-yard line to win the game. I mean, literally win it. 
you know, and we really stumble, really, really look bad on those last two plays. And that's, you know, a little bit of everything. So, you know, that's that's kind of how I see it. I, mean, I wonder what the thought process going with the fade with T.Y. Hilton. That just, it, it well, wasn't, and it looked like his shoe came off too on the route, but it just, it didn't, that thing struggled. wasn't going to happen. I don't think that thing happens 95 out of 100 times, Rick, well, honestly. That, well, first of all, you know, I, I, I have to say in general, um, you know, I thought I thought Frank was masterful in the first two games of, you know, kind of hiding the the warts and uh, you know, kind of exaggerating everybody's ability, maxing it out, if you will. Um, I thought he struggled, and I knew that it was coming because eventually, you can't dink and dunk to win the whole time. You cannot you cannot create separation every single down to get the three yard gain. And Philadelphia played exactly like I thought they would. They, they, they splintered in a little bit of cover, too, but not much. They played kind of an inverted two. They did, they did have a couple rolls. But overall, they did exactly what I thought they'd do. They defended the middle of the field, and they sat down on routes. Um, you know, they pressed a little bit more on the outside, and they really just tried to squash you, totally take away the run like they always do and then, you know, totally squash your passing game. And the thing that we weren't able to do, and this is a problem, and I thought it would become a problem, is we can't really consistently win on the outside. Uh, You know, Hilton is a certain kind of deep guy. And honest to God, I wish we'd have pushed him deeper, though, even with what we had. Maybe it's because of the tackles and the protection issues, but this uh, this was a team, and I said it all week. I'm not saying it after the fact. You had to win this game on the outside of the field. You had to have big numbers outside. Um, you had to have your wide receivers beat their corners because they're strung out the whole game. And as I said, we did get the two PIs, so you could add 60 yards to Hilton's game and get him over 100, but he was at 50, and Grant had 34. So, I mean, I keep saying we don't have a two in the sense of what a two really has to do, and that is stretch the field in a game like this and beat a guy like Darby with an out and up. And I didn't think we tested them nearly enough because that was the one spot. You're not going to beat Philadelphia inside. It's just not going to happen. I mean, it's just tactically it's not going to happen, much less physically it's not going to happen. And when Frank wasn't able to stay ahead of the count, this is the other thing I told you, is everybody was doing victory laps about our offensive line. They were writing articles. They were putting them in the Pro Football Weekly. And I said, don't take a victory lap on that offensive line because they're a product of the scheme. As long as we stay in the third and four or short, they'll survive. The minute you get a bunch of third and longs, you're going to see what it is, and that was the two that we well, were two for twelve, and and there was a lot of pressure, and you know just kind of collapsing of the pocket. I mean, it just and then you 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 weren't able to get the separation, you weren't beating them on the outside. So a lot of the things that we worried about originally uh, really did come back to haunt us in this game, uh, you know, and and you know that's just kind of the way it is, and then taking it down to those last two plays, uh, again, with the praise of the first two, um, the praise of the first two weeks has has to go the criticism uh, when it doesn't go well. And I've said this all along, the only fade receiver you have on this team is Ebron. Um, And, you know, if you you would isolate Ebron outside and throw the fade and throw a potential 50-50 ball, Then you need a size guy. You need a a catching radius and girth out on the fade. You're not. I mean, T. Y. Hilton is just so little. Grant Grant caught one on a perfect throw, but they're little guys. They're not. They're not jump ball guys that you're gonna. And and we lack that. And uh, the only time, actually, we got one last week to Ebron. Why we didn't go there this week, I really don't know. Because if you're going to throw a fade, you got to think players, not plays, and you got to put players in a chance to win. So I didn't like that at all. And then the last play, the the problem with it was you left, you know, on that last play, you you left uh, uh, the guy on the left side. I can't think. Barnett. Uh, yeah, you left Barnett. You know, one on one with little Raven Clark. And, you know, again, whenever you do that, you know, then you're running the risk of what can happen. And, you know, we did the play action. And if it wasn't Clark, it was going to be Graham. Well, yeah, Graham, Graham, you saw, I think it was Wilkins, right, that tried to chip on he Graham, and he, well, he had it, no chance. 
yeah, it's it's what we call fire protection. It's a it's a fire. Uh, actually, we did it on the very first play of the game. We hit a little snag to Hilton. That was called a fire snag seven. This was a fire double cross, and we were trying to rub uh, for Hilton come, you know, one receiver coming from the weak side. And really what you want to do is hit Ebron uh, sneaking back on the backside. Well, Philadelphia played it perfectly. They were in their man-to-man, but they, they played man-to-man with zone-off principles, and they zoned off those receivers, and they had them. They had it covered, period. They even had the back door covered, which surprised me. Usually you'll sneak that one in there. And, uh, you know, and then, but in doing that, if you didn't have instant, instant guy open, you were going to have a Raven Clark on Barnett and that, you know, that ended up being the game. So, you know, if you want to be critical of those two, I, I think you can legitimately be critical. So uh, Rick Venturi on the Andy Moore Automotive Group Hotline. Every Monday right here, it's must listen. All right, Andrew Luck. So I, I'm, I'm told by, by folks that this is fully expected, you know, as far as where his, his, his arm strength and there's nothing wrong, everything is completely okay. What did you see in that second half specifically? It seemed to me like you saw as the second half went along him lose velocity from the one he threw across the field that McLeod, you know, had like 100 years to get in to break up to um, just not going down the field in general for chunk plays. Is this all a product of watching him trying to come back after missing a year with that shoulder? Well, I don't know. I mean, I mean, you know, whether or not he goes deep a lot is a product. He 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 overthrew, uh, you know, he overthrew one inside. I mean, a lot of that is schematically what you're doing. And I I think we've gotten to a point now where we we just won't take the shot anymore. We've gotten to that point. Is that, that be- it, is that because of his his throwing? I think I think it. I don't think it is, but I may be wrong on that. I. You know, I would I would argue more placement in this game than velocity. Although I've never thought. Honestly, I've always said that I always thought that he had a level that he had to reach. I, I never thought that he was necessarily ripping the ball as hard as he ever has. I always thought it was he was he was throwing it functionally enough to win with, and you and you're still two plays away from winning. I mean, the fade. Yeah, is, yeah, that had nothing to do with it. But we're just talking I, I, while we're not. I don't. While I don't, we're not seeing shots down the field. I yeah, guess. I don't. I'm not sure. You know, I just I just don't think that they take a lot of shots because they don't want to put when you when you take shots downfield. Let's let's understand this is you have to hold the protection at tackle. You can max protection, but you, you – and Slauson had a tough day too. I mean, when Bennett came in there on him, that was – he was like a sieve. So, I mean, you had three issues against this team. You had Slauson, you had Haig, who was in the quarterback's lap all day, all day long. And then you have LaRaven Clark, who's an accident waiting to happen on the left side. So you're very careful in how long you have to – you hold the ball. And you if you're going to take shots deep – you have to hold the ball to do that, uh, especially if they're in off coverage. You have to let it develop, and I, and I think that's an issue. I think that's an issue that probably, you know, that you know we 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 really struggled with in the first two games, but we got by with it. But as teams start to squash you down and sit on your wideouts. And remember, Hilton can be pressed. Hilton is good in some areas, but Hilton needs free access. I mean, when he was pressed. The only thing he got was the two PIs. He wasn't able he wasn't able to beat him, but he and Grant ain't gonna be nobody in press. So it's just the way it is, and we're gonna have to figure out, you know, better ways to do that. Uh, I was a little disappointed in how they try to run the ball. I didn't think that you could run the ball efficiently with two tight ends. I thought the only way to keep them honest was to open it up in nickel sets. And all these things are things that I said last week. I, I will never come back on Monday and say, well, you should have done this if I haven't approached it ahead of time. You know that. And so I was a little disappointed from that standpoint. But the biggest disappointment to me was I felt going in that the only way, and Fitzpatrick showed the way. Now, Tampa is so much better at wideout than us. They're more physical. You know, they're faster. They're everything else. I mean, they threw for 404 yards on this team. So, you know, and if you if you can't do it against Philly, then you'll have a hard time You'll have a hard time uh, beating them. 
So Rick Venturi with us. I, I kind of asked this a little bit earlier, kind of knocking this around. Do you think offensively all this short rhythm type of passing that we see, uh, obviously you, you stated this, and this is for sure, it is to help protect Andrew Luck. There's no doubt. Okay, first and foremost. But you think it's also to mask maybe that arm strength is not fully back for Luck yet, too? I, I really don't. I, I think it's a. I think it's two things. You know, I might, I might be wrong. I, you know, I, I think his arm strength. I mean, I mean, I've been to every practice. I think his arm strength's good enough. You know, yeah. I don't think that it's. I don't think it's elite. I don't. You know, I, don't, I really don't. I mean, but it's. Do you think it's, it's different than it was two years ago? Oh, I think it's a little different. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I do. No, I do. I think there is. I think there's. I think there's a little difference. I've always said that I thought there was another ceiling that he had to get to, and I think he's leveled off. I don't think he's gotten to that ceiling. I don't think that's the bigger issue, though, honestly. Um, I think when you ask me the question the way you're asking, and from a coach's perspective, what I see is I see offensive line that I have three positions that i got to worry about if I'm going to hold the ball. Because Now, we were criticizing the last staff because they didn't think about that, and they kept throwing seven-step drops and getting Andrew killed, and he was holding the ball and all that narrative. So, you know, we have that too. So what we have to do is find the happy medium. I think you have a, you have a critical offensive tackle position, which we all know, and that's the key position that forces you to throw quick. The other thing we have is we have a real separation issue. I mean, you know, Ryan Grant, I, he, every, he, everybody loves him, and he's a dirty work guy, and I want him on my team, but he can't run. Okay, Hilton is a guy that you can press, so you're always moving him around to get him free access into their secondary. So, again, I said I gave Frank a lot of credit for maxing out a lot of average. Now, the average will catch up with you eventually by game plan, and I think that's what happened a little bit on Sunday. Did I think Luck played great? Absolutely not. You know, I thought the first red zone throw to uh, Ebron, not so much the bank board throw, but the first throw, he had it. I thought he should have led him right into the end zone. You know, I thought the placement, it wasn't velocity to me, it was the placement. Uh, the bank board throw, that's where you throw it to Ebron. Let him, let him use his big body, and then he don't come up with it. You know, he plays kind of listless, too. I mean, I, you know, his, his warts in time begin to show up also why he struggled at Detroit. And so, you know, in a, in a way, Frank is in a bind. He's, he's done a great job of maxing it out on offense. But as I've been saying all along, eventually you've got to be careful, and that's why I watch the tape, you know, just like watch the defensive tape. We can, we can crown guys, but there's a lot of bad things happening in there too that you better be alert for. Um, but, you know, in this case, you know, it catches up with you when they begin to sit down on you and they have good rushers like Philadelphia did. It's uh, Rick Venturi. He's on the Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline. So do you think um, – what, what do you think about – listen, I wasn't too much about the Hail Mary. We, we talked about this. Right. I didn't think too much about it. I mean, I, I did – I did understand. I, I kind of equated it too, and, and so did some other listeners too. You know, maybe bringing in McAfee to kick it uh, seventy yards yeah. because Vinatieri couldn't reach it there. So that was kind of the, the common denominator there that we talked yeah, I think about. That's fair. But yeah. but Rick, Rick, even with no timeouts, and and you're not, you're probably not going to get the job done. But those those dink and dunk passes that was like excruciating. It just it just well it, it, was, it just it was, why, why don't you chuck it down the field? Why? why? It, was, it was very hard to watch. Uh, in what Jim Swartz did, he knew he was protecting seven, so he sat. By, he put a picket fence back there that you weren't going to throw it in there. And I think what Frank was banking on is the only way he could win it was to get it down around the fifty and then take the chance at the hail mary. That you know that penalty hurt too. I mean, yeah. you know we had so many penalties in that fourth quarter that just were devastating. And one that is forgotten on that special teams, which added 10 yards, um, you know, on the drive there that we had to get. So, you know, I mean, I'd like to say throw it downfield, but I'm not sure where. I mean, you know, they got they had they have, they have seven guys defending from the 50. Well, back t- to well the teams goal line. will teams begin now to show even more. Um, just beat us down the field if you're going to beat us type of mentality defensively. Oh, I don't think there's any question about it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm almost shocked that they haven't done it already, but I don't think – you see, you don't really define yourself in training camp. And we had that big advantage in Cincinnati 
and uh, and carried it right through. And and basically, we knew Washington's defense so well. Uh, you know, those guys had played against Washington. I mean, I mean, I knew Minuski like the back of my hand, and he plays so much man to man that you can just rub every down and get free guys. Uh, you know, which we were able to do. But yeah, I mean, people are gonna people are gonna defense you. They're gonna they're gonna sit down on you. Um, what what you see, what you saw with uh, with uh, Schwartz and those guys at Philly, is they just started matching you coming off. In other words, you can play zone coverage or match zone coverage. Match zone coverage means that you don't take the big drop. You open to your zone, but you pick up whoever's coming quickly, and you play a man-to-man within your zone. Sometimes you'll pass one off, sometimes you don't. That's a very a different than, than dropping back into an area zone and responding to the ball. And when teams do that, they give us the advantage because we can nickel and dime, dink and dunk underneath them uh, without creating a lot of separation. Once they start to match zone and tough man-to-man rat, then you have to create separation. You have to get it. And, and again, by not moving it, not moving it on first and second down, which we've done so well, we were leading the league on third down at 60%, but that was, a, that was skewed because we were in so many third and short situations. I've said this on your show a million times, John. If you're third and three on offense or you're third and eight, there's almost a 70% swing historically on your ability to convert. So those first two downs matter. And to answer your question, you're, you should see more and more people do that. Absolutely. But particularly teams that are very, what I call game specifics. And I, I think Houston is, I, I think Houston, I think, I think they, you know, Romeo has the background of Belichick. They will, you know, they will try to play you as you are, not just play their system. It's uh, Rick Venturi with us. So two of 12 on third down, one of five within the red zone. It uh, doesn't get much more ugly, those numbers, offensively, does it? Oh, no, you couldn't. I mean, really and truly, uh, you lost. You know, it's what's really amazing is when you actually look at the tape and you look at the numbers, how we were two plays away from winning the game. <laughs> what a grave now, there. The, the reason, you know, the reason that we were there was, one, as bad as the offense was, and it was bad to me, there was no turnover. So we didn't have a turnover. We, we, we did win the turnover battle, which normally kind of keeps you around. And then defensively, we had, we had two stops out of four in the red zone, which has been the best thing we've done. We've been, you know, we've been good at that in the summertime. We give up a million yards between the 20s, but we've held up. So we, we had two stops in the red zone, and we had the two critical turnovers. So, you know, in that sense, you know, in that sense, that's what saved us. It was red zone defense, uh, two big turnovers, and, I mean, yeah, two big turnovers and no turnovers by us. And just that alone kept us in the game. You know, it kept us in the game because we didn't give up a lot of points. To, you know, they got two sevens, usually 20 points. Um, 20 points is, is, is in, in modern-day football is playoff uh, defense, but in the end, I started to talk about the metrics. In the end, though, you do still have to win the fourth quarter, and we lost the fourth quarter, seven to three. Um, you know, the the rushing statistic was a killer: thirty-five yards with our running backs. The only run we had was Andrew, yep. and uh, they had a hundred and fifty-two. That's really that's that's the tail of the tape as well in a game that's so tight. Um, but you know that that is what it is. I mean, again, we're very very competitive. Uh, we have a, a desperation game this week at home. Um, you know, with the Texans who are off to a bad start record wise, but you know they've been close in every game. They're own three, but you know the the the, the scoring differential is tight as a drum. So you know, and and uh, certainly J J Watt brought his A game back for the. You know, all the rust was there for a while, but he, he he took it off. He polished it off this week. All right. I tell you what, I want to put you on hold here. I want you to think about a couple of things. If you'd have told me that the Colts were going to sack Carson Wentz five times, I would have said somebody's drunk. We'll get to that. Uh, the defense and why it has looked so good, other than that 17-play drive where things didn't go right yesterday. And we'll talk about the offensive line now moving forward without um, Joe Haig, as we learned today, okay? So we'll come back with that and a lot more. Rick Venturi the most important interview you got to hear all week regarding the Colts is right here and right now. FM 107.5 1070 The Fan.
It's all things Colts with former coach Rick Venturi. The Ride with JMV on FM 1075 and 1070 The Fan. Colts Roundtable, live, top of the hour. Tomorrow, Anthony Walker. Tomorrow, Greg Rakestraw. Right now, something you got to hear every week after five. Rick Venturi rejoins. All right, we talked about left and right tackle being a problematic situation, certainly yesterday in Philly. So moving forward now for the next couple of weeks without Joe Haig, what do you think? Well, you know, I think I don't think Joe Haig played very well. I mean, you hate to lose him. I hate to lose him. He's a Swiss Army knife. Um, you know, but when he played every down against good players, I mean, he was in he was in Andrew Luck's lap all day. Um, I don't think that there's an appreciable difference between him and Good at right tackle. If you follow what I'm saying, I did, and that's not a big knock on 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 Hague. It's just we have, we knew we were going to struggle at right tackle no matter who was there, and we never expected not to have Costanzo. Now, LaRaven Clark, for better or worse, is the best guy you have at left tackle. I've always said that, even though he struggles. So you've got to stay with him, and you just got to know that you got to help him because they've got two guys that can ruin your game. Uh, you know, uh, what, uh, Watt, who normally – now, he lines up everywhere, but he's primarily on our right side. So, you know, whoever plays right tackle will be tested. And then the guy that has not had the great season, had a great season a year ago, that's, that just came back last week, uh, is Jadavian Clowney, who will be on the other side. So – you know, those two guys, they're probably, you know, you're going to have to help them and get back to that quick stuff um, and all that kind of stuff. But that, that will be an ongoing issue. But I don't think the difference in Hague and Good is that big, to be honest with you. Give me some of the surprises defensively, and how much sure. better are they playing than you thought or the level in which they're playing now compared to what you thought at the beginning of the season? Oh, there's no question about it that they, they have uh, – they've outstripped my expectations. Um uh, and yet there's some things that are very troubling to me that they got to fix um, because they are getting by with um, basically saving it in the red zone. And that's great. The number one thing that you've got to do, the number one thing that you grade your defense on is points given up. And I think they're around 13th. I mean, they're, they definitely are keeping the scores winnable. And that the most important thing is to is to keep the point total down. You can you can lead in a lot of other categories, but that's number one. And I think you know credit them. I think our secondary, and I've been saying this for a few weeks. This is the one area that I've I I, I recognize. I think before everyone else is I think their secondary is better. It's a little bit better than than we thought it was. In what they're not doing, they're not giving up a lot of big plays over the top. It's not like they haven't given up any, but they're not giving many up over the top. Now, they've given up some chunk plays in there, but not just not a ton over the top that, that are scores to start with. And then they've defended very well in the red zone. I mean, they, they did that all summer. In the summer, you know, the ball would just soar down there, and it still does. I mean, it still does at some times. But, you know, the, the zones are tighter Everything, the scheme looks a lot better in the red zone, particularly the coverage part of it. So that's been a, that's been a really plus. And, and I kind of expected that because that was there in the summertime. And I'd like to go back to that because there's a lot of stuff that was there in the summer that is there today. Now, uh, where they're so much better than anticipated. Here's where they're better. And it starts with Marcus Hunt. I don't think anybody saw that coming. Um, Marcus Hunt has been a disruptor, and in that sense, our front has been so much more disruptive than anticipated. Now, that has a lot to do with the scheme. We're doing a lot of stunning and moving, you know, and taking off in there. Now, it has been a godsend against the pass. You talked about the sacks. Between blitzes and line stunts, that has been a godsend for us and has really elevated our play. Our stunts versus the run have killed us, absolutely killed us. And the problem with this, when you, when you have this kind of setup, is you tend to be a lighter-ass defense, and so you end up stunning a lot. Of, you bring those ends down inside a lot to stop the run, and that's why our edge defense just is awful at times. I mean, just, I mean like I said, Smallwood and Adams, okay, Smallwood, Adams, and Clement, you don't get 152 yards. So, but 
as far as getting to the passer, that was your original question in the last segment. A lot of that is line stunning that has been outstanding. Uh, but Hunt has been maybe I, I bet you if you took a a poll in my world, they'd say the the most the the obvious surprise is Leonard that he's playing at the high level that he's playing. But the biggest surprise I would say would be Margus Hunt because I think Margus has always been considered a journeyman. He was basically a reject. Hey, he's Cincinnati. thirty-one years old. Cincinnati. And normally, you are what you are. You are, but here's the, the difference, and I think here's the difference. And I give Coach Fair really a lot of credit with that defensive line because, you know, whether you like this scheme or you don't like this scheme, he's got those guys attacking. You know, sometimes it's purposeless. Sometimes it hurts us on the run. But we are getting closer. We, you know, the five sacks, again, it's either it, it was either stunting, uh, and we're running a lot of stunts in there, the exits, the text games, uh, you know, ba- basically sheared, and uh, Toure came around, the, came around unblocked on the text. Um and so we're getting a lot of mileage out of that. I uh, here's what I thought about the defense from a coaching perspective. I thought that the the original plan. I always I always talk about the um, you know the the anticipation factor and how you start the game. I'd give them a D. I mean, we weren't ready on that first series. We were playing a high school zone. We were dropping. We were only rushing three. I don't even know where that came from. We only had ten guys on the field on the fourth play. And then we had a total mistake in the uh, on the touchdown to, to Ertz. It was like, holy cow! But I'll give him a B plus to an A to Eberflus on immediate adjustment. He made immediate adjustment. He screwed down that coverage tight. I'll give him a B plus also on calling the game. I thought he called a really good game. I thought he kept it in there tight. And then I thought he, you know, really he's he's had a terrific. Um, sense for calling the blitz. We haven't blitzed a ton, but when we have, it's been some amazingly effective. And I think that happens if you trickle the blitz. If you're not blitzing every down, and you trickle the blitz, and you keep it for key situations, uh, it can be it can be amazing. And we got two sacks on the blitz. I mean, Leonard is he's a hell of a player, but he's also the luckiest guy in the world. He has not been blocked on three blitzes in two weeks. He's come totally unblocked to the quarterback. I heard somebody say he threw the back off. No way. There's nobody blocked him in the last two weeks on those blitzes. So he ought to, he ought to give, uh, give Eberfluss a hug on some of those because he's been really timely uh, on that. But secondary a little bit better than we thought. Um, much, much more disruptive up front, including Sheard. The three guys that have had the biggest impact, of course, is Hunt. And I love Hunt inside. I think Hunt has been devastating inside. And as far as the 31-year-old, here's the one thing with Hunt I think you have to factor in. Hunt is a guy that we are also, we're gaining the advantage by sticking with him and give Ballard credit for that is sticking with him. This is a kid who had no football background. This guy didn't even know what a football was until he came here to Southern Methodist. And so he and he was basically a backup at Cincy. He's really learned football at the NFL level. So we're getting him at the top end now. I mean, really, you know, staying with him has been a terrific experiment because he's there. Sheard has kind of been the guy we thought he was, that power player on the left side good stunt guy is around the quarterback um, and that kind of stuff. And Toure has been showing it to you. I mean, Toure has got that speed off the edge. He's, uh, he's not too far away from, you know, I think some impact there. The saddest thing for Eberfluss, I'll tell you where I felt for him most in this game. i tell you where I felt with him most in this game was on the third and nine. On the third and nine, he brings, he brings the heat. He brings gathers off our left side. He's got Toure coming off the right. Uh, the only thing I hate is they played a fire zone behind it. They didn't play man-to-man behind it. They played a fire zone. But anyway, and we've got Wentz. I'm telling you, it couldn't have been a more perfect call and, and gathers, gathers whiffs on him. I yeah. mean, he, he makes yeah. gathers miss. Toure get, can't get him from the backside. He steps out. Because we're playing zone behind the blitz, Walker and uh, and Sheard, they lose Aguilar coming across. And then the thing I absolutely hate, and you can love Hooker, but he came up with one of those crap butt uh, roll tackles. If he comes up and makes the tackle, he's going to tackle him like two yards short. 
he comes on one of those rolls and Aguilar dive, just jump dives over it and does the somersault. And, you know, that, you know, they got to get him to do that. That that's kind of ridiculous. I mean, that, that roll tackling is not going to make it. So, but anyway, you know, again, I thought that they did a really good job, but I would say a secondary, uh, a little bit better than we thought schematically not giving up a lot of big plays, making you work for it, really tightening in the red zone, um, you know, Leonard's overall ability, and I think Walker played pretty well, too. Um, I think that's probably been at – well, it, it isn't a total surprise because they look good in training camp, but to play this well this early is real good. But I'd say more than anything else and as far as against the pass is the disruption up front. All right, Rick, quick break. We'll come back, and I want to get your thoughts, your early thoughts on Houston. A team that's 0-3 and has struggled beyond struggle. So sit tight, okay? Mm -hmm. Rick Venturi, final time, must listen every Monday after 5, right here on FM 107.5 at 1070 The Fan. It's all things Colts with former coach Rick Venturi. The Ride with JMV on FM 107.5 at 1070 The Fan. Well, you got to hear it each and every Monday Five o'clock, five o'clock hour. Rick Venturi, Andy Moore, Automotive Group Hotline. So, 0 3 Houston, what has gone right? I guess maybe it's easier to find what's gone right and at least what you have seen so far leading up to Sunday's game. Okay, that, that's a good way to do it, John. Okay, on, <laughs> de- on defense, um, what's gone right for them is J.J. Watt last Sunday. Um, you know, he kind of struggled through the first two games, um, you know, kind of, you know, getting the rust off. And then last Sunday, he was a monster. I think he had three sacks. He had two tackles for loss. Um, I'll have this <laughs> a Thursday afternoon. I'll have it all on tape for the fans on the Colt website. Colts.com, um, by the way, because, too. Yeah, because he is, uh, you know, he, him coming back is the best uh, of what they have. They actually, to me, are underachieving on defense. I like a lot of their players. Um, you know, obviously, it starts with Watt. Clowney on the other side can be a monster. Um, Reader's a really tough nose tackle. They got decent backers. I think Joseph is one of the best corners in the league. Um, you know, bringing uh, the, the kid from LSU, Mathau, in there. Honey Badger, he is an outstanding safety. Jackson's an out. They've got Jackson at safety now. I do think that uh, you can beat them. You're going to have to throw the ball some. They really struggle inside with direct runs. It just seems like their team is so much better on the edge than it is inside. Um, team, you know, and you can you can just see it from their rush defense. I mean, it's not you know they're they're not very good right now. They're the 18th in total defense, 20th in the rush. Um, but it's hard to get outside on those edges. You have to get that ball up in there quick. Um, I think you can throw the ball inside. I'd say their weakest positions to throw the football is inside, tight ends on their linebackers. Um, If you get into spread some, as long as you can protect, they'll walk a linebacker out. You can get a a mismatch there um, at linebacker. And then you want to work on their left corner. Joseph will play the right corner. Uh, they expected Johnson to be that left corner, and they moved Jackson to safety. They may have to move Jackson back to corner. Um, they're playing right over there. They're playing Colvin. Colvin is an outstanding nickel, but he's an average corner. So left corner, inside on the linebackers, run the ball direct as a general rule. Got to have a plan for those two edge guys, and Watts liable to line up everywhere except he's doing most of his damage off their left side, and Clowney mostly off our right side. So we'll have our hands full with those guys. Defense underachieving, but always, you know, and then they give you those tough third down packages like they did with Romeo. And and what they've done to us in the past is get up and fake blitz inside. And if you remember last year, and it's the same coaching staff, bring those perimeter blitzes on you. So, you know, those are things you got to be ready for on offense. Um, you know, they've got a pretty good running game. They've always been ranked high. Uh, they're eighth this year. They're eighth overall, believe it or not. And, you know, basically Lamar Miller, you know, and Alfred Blue are two good, solid running backs, no question about that. Hopkins, you got to have a plan for. Hopkins is one of the premier top three guys in the league, top four anyway. Tremendous catcher. We know all that. He's the best possession guy in the league. 
They got a couple role players in Ellington at the slot and Fuller deep from Notre Dame. Um, the quarterback, you have to have a rush plan. And I believe the best way to play him is to keep him in the pocket. Come with four, come with five, but keep him in. Do not let him escape. He makes the great plays on the move. He actually had a spectacular day last week. He threw one interception at the end, but it was because he was running wild. But he is a monster. You can't just go into this game and run wild on him. Now, the biggest weakness they have, if you look at their team overall, you'll like it until you look at the offensive line. And their offensive line has holes everywhere. Uh, the only really good player is Martin, you know, from right here in Indianapolis and Notre Dame at center. Uh, other than that, they're both edge tackles. They had, Remember, they had signed Central Henderson to play the left tackle, and then he got hurt. He's out for the season. So they're playing a rookie ranking at left tackle, um, and, and they're struggling over there at, at right tackle as well. Um, they, they, they're really having trouble on both sides. So, you know, this is, this is a team that you can really, really – it's Davenport on the right side. You can rush this team, but what you got to do is you got to rush to that quarterback's upfield shoulder. You can't rush and come under because if you do, this kid will get outside. And I, I, I think he's he's only so so accurate in the pocket. I, I've never I've never seen Sunday accuracy total if he's basically playing NFL football. If you let him get out and play Saturday football then you're in for it. If you remember when he got oh, hurt, like, yeah. he oh, had the yeah. number one QBR in the league last year when he got hurt. So, uh, first, uh, by, by the way, first round with Rick Venturi on Colts.com. When's your first segment go up? Uh, Thursday uh, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Yep. Friday, the defensive plan uh, will be up at 1. And then uh, Saturday at 9 in the morning, the, uh, the motivational plan. So You're the man. We'll give you all three. You're the man. Thanks as always, my friend. Great stuff as usual. Enjoyed it as always, John. Rick Venturi right there. Again, Colts.com for first down with Rick Venturi. The podcast right here is must listen. 1070thefan.com. Quick slant and uh, six, what is it? 684-6555. 